That's a big room. Definitely. Uh, my first question to you would be is how you got started in the wrestling business and were you a fan growing up? Yeah, I was a big fan growing up. And uh, I remember walking into a friend of mine's house in probably the fourth or fifth grade. His father, you want me to look at you or the camera? You look at the camera. Okay. Yep. Uh, he had a picture of Ron Wright on uh, on his, uh, his father had a picture of Ron Wright on his uh, uh, TV set. And I was fascinated by that. And then I, I, I was, uh, I watched it on Saturday mornings. So you know, we had regional territories in Knoxville. So it was, uh, uh, you know, Southeastern wrestling then. You know, Ron and Don Ryan and those guys. And uh, from there, uh, I went to see him wrestle one time at uh, uh, Bill Myers Park, baseball park in Knoxville. And uh, I just watched it, just was a fan. And then when I was in high school, my sister was dating Barry O, my born junior's brother. And, uh, and so I went to a few matches with her and I was wrestling in school and uh, living with my sister at that time. And uh, she introduced me to Barry. It was funny because Barry came in drunk one night and was wrestling with me, and I kind of got the best of him. And he took me and introduced me to Malenko. Okay, I guess uh, to you, how much of an influence was uh, Buddy Rogers? Were you a fan of the Nature Boy Buddy Rogers early on in your career? I never even knew who Buddy Rogers was. I, I, I didn't. I had no clue who Buddy Rogers was until I actually broke into business. And. Uh, I was always a Ric Flair fan, but I never really knew what who Ric Flair was because that's how insulated that the territories were. You know, uh, people in Knoxville didn't have that. We didn't have a clue who uh, uh, we didn't have a clue who Ric Flair was or anybody outside of our territory, Knoxville, and through there. So, right. uh, unless the world champion, whoever the world champion was, they would come and do that. But we didn't even have a clue who. I didn't have a clue who Buddy Rogers was. Gotcha. So how did you actually break into the business? And, and let's talk about the training of the Malenkos and the original business. Yeah, I, uh, when, uh, when Barry Horton introduced me to Malenko, he had trials. There was like 25 guys that tried out, and I was one of the 25, and I was actually the only guy that made it. And uh, so I started training with Malenko then. Uh, it was about six months of training every day, and we'd go down to the uh, – to the Tom Black track in Knoxville, University of Tennessee football stadium there. We worked out, he wouldn't, he would not teach you how to uh, to even lock up until you, you had to be able to run five miles and do 500 squats and 500 push-ups at the same time without stopping. And when you did that, that's when he would teach you how to lock up. Did you see a lot of guys uh, quitting early on? Everybody, everybody quit the first day. Wow. We had to run like two miles. We had to run like two miles the first day. And everybody dropped out, and I was the only guy, you know. Then we had to pay, I think in 1979, I think I paid something like uh, uh, $1,500 back then, 30 years ago, to break in. Wow. The business, yeah. Did you see uh, Malenko stretch anybody? No, no, because I was the only one, uh, I was the only one that he was training. Right. There was not, no stretching going on. Wasn't anything like the Anderson's way of uh, school? Yeah, uh, now the, the, at the same time I was training the Dirty White Boy, Tony Anthony, Daryl Anthony, that I actually went to school with, high school with, he was training with uh, Rick Connors, which was a, a great guy. He's trained a lot of guys, but you know, in wrestling, your calling card is who trained you. Right. You know, if you've got a big name that trained you, it, it kind of opened doors for you. So uh, I used to watch uh, them train over there a little bit. Malenko would get on me and say, nah, don't worry about the crap they're doing. You know, just listen to what I'm doing. And Malenko and I would wrestle around a little bit. I never could, you know, do much with him. I mean, he was a hoss. He was pretty stout. Would you consider uh, Malenko your mentor, pretty much? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I would consider, he's the one that broke me in, but Bob Roof was probably my mentor because I lived with Molly and, Molly and Bob Roof. I was going to ask you, what are your memories of uh, living with Bob Roof? Yeah. Well, I mean, you just got kind of a crash course. By then, they they had the split in they had the split in uh, uh, Knoxville where Bob Root and Orton Jr. Garvin Savage and all of those guys broke away from Fuller uh, and, and uh, the Armstrongs and uh, Dick Slater and Kevin Sullivan. All of those guys. So when I broke into business, I actually thought wrestling was real because these guys were carrying guns in the car. They were making open challenges to each other. That was yeah. yeah, the company split. Yeah. yeah, the company split. I mean, it was an actual what you know sure. what I would become later, become <laughs> to know later is shoot. So they they were shooting, 
And I, I didn't even know what a shoot was. All I knew would know is that Bob Roop and those guys were training every day. I mean, they were drinking, you know, Miller Light and eating popcorn and just, just training every day and dropped a lot of weight fast. And uh, Ronnie Garvin would had a bay liner yacht. He would, he would put the, the, the tie rope around the front of the boat, put it around his chest and swim the boat all over. These guys just stayed in tremendous shape and they were making, you know, challenges and threats to these guys every night. So, I mean, but at this time now, I'm still, this is in the six month period that I'm training and I, I, I had no idea that you know this business was a was a was a work. I had no idea. Wow. Because Malenko never smartened me up. Never talked about the brute, never broke K Fabe, never broke never broke uh, K Fabe and never talked about the business. So I mean I'm just kinda like an errand boy a little bit, setting the ring up and learning that aspect of it. And uh, being around Bob Roof and those guys, you know, Bob was a little bit more open, but they still were K Fabe me and I you know, I thought it was a shoot, you know. Who started you up? Was uh, that just happened over time? Or? Just happened a little bit over time, yeah. Huh. Yeah. As far as the training goes, what to you was the most difficult thing to pick up? Would it be the bumping, the psychology? Um, probably the psychology was, was, was the toughest. Thing. You know, I was an athlete all my life, so the moves came fairly easy once you learn them. Right. right? I mean, there's only so many variations of, you know, headlock that you can do. But I mean, I, I, what I did was I picked, I picked stuff that I thought the guys, what, what's, if a guy did something that looked really good, I would steal it from him. Like Leap and Lanny did the most beautiful, you know, snatch the headlock. So I adapted my headlock from him. My punches, I tried to adapt from, you know, Bob Orton Jr. Uh, and, and so on. And, uh, but the psychology was, was a little, you know, one, one, the psychology is something you either have or you don't have. You really can't teach anybody. If they don't have it and they ain't never going to have it, there ain't no way to teach it to them. Right. They're, they're pretty much stuck at being first, second match or, you know, whatever. But psychology is something that, you know, a main event guy's got to have. What are your memories of your first match? Oh, I remember it well. It was in Johnson City, Tennessee at the Park and Rec Center. It was against Bob Orr Jr. in 1979, wow. March of 79. Huh. Yeah, and uh, he, uh, uh, I was really, really nervous, and uh, he just basically stretched me. <laughs> right. Speaking of stretching, did you ever witness uh, Bob Root stretch anybody or, or shoot on guys? No, no, I never witnessed that. No, but Bob, I mean, he could have. Right, right. Yeah, but mm -hmm. but no, no, he was, you know, it, it was uh, it was cool living with Bob too because I mean he took me under his wing, and actually when I went to. Uh, uh, Sunbelt wrestling with Malenko and them in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. I, I call myself Buddy Root. Right. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Whose ideas was it for you uh, to dye your hair blonde? Tom Renesso Sr. Okay. Yeah, he, uh, I was in Memphis, uh, 1982, and there was a bunch of us generic uh, baby faces in the I mean, in the dress room. There was, you know, Tommy Rogers, Steve Kern, me, Terry Taylor, Bobby, Bobby Rogers, and, you know, just all of us guys that with dark hair and young, good looking guys. And, and uh, Tom Ernesto came up to me and asked me if I would consider bleaching my hair and coming to Puerto Rico. I'm not like, sure. Huh. Yeah. Right. Did you ever worry, uh, I guess, immediately that guys would resent it since Flair had, you know, similar gimmick at all? Or not? Nah? No, because uh, I had known Flair, well, since I got in business, and this was 1983, so I'd known Flair about four years. He was always very kind to me, always really nice, always willing to help. Uh, and. Uh, that, but uh, Puerto Rico was and Roddy Piper was flying down for Carlos to uh, the World Council down there, and uh, I was wrestling a guy named uh, Grand Apo El Gran Apollo, and he was a big muscle guy too, and, and uh, we were having a bench press contest, and and uh, he he, uh, he he liked to really shoot, he didn't really like to wrestle. I mean, he really liked to fight. It was hard working with him because he wanted to shine and be the star. And Flair and uh, Piper used to come out and watch my matches because they thought it was so funny that it was like 90% shoot between him and I. But, uh, you know, Flair, uh, that's the first time Flair had saw me with blonde hair. And really nobody had ever really put that together until I left Puerto Rico and went to Memphis in 83. And Lawler actually gave me the name Nature Boy. That's how it all came about that right. Memphis. Before you went to Memphis, what are some uh, other territories that you worked for? You talked about Puerto Rico and uh, working for Carlos. Uh, what was that like with WWC? Well, 79, I started out with My first one was All-Star Championship Wrestling, which evolved into ICW. Papa's. From ICW, I went to Jacksonville, Florida in 81. Uh, from Jacksonville, Florida, I went to Bill Watts. 
uh, from Bill Watts, I went to uh, uh, Charlotte, uh, and then from Charlotte, uh, I went to Memphis, and then from Memphis back down to Watts, and then uh, right around that time, I went to San Antonio, Texas in 82 for, for Blanchard. Right, Southwest. Right, for Southwest. Yeah, and from there, uh, I think right after that, I went to uh, Puerto Rico. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk about all the different territories you worked for definitely coming up. Um, let's talk about Memphis. What was it like working in Memphis your first time? Uh, the first time... Mm, well, it was real short territory. Well, Memphis is funny because you you, uh, you you were on the A team or the B team. If you were on the B team, if you were on the A team, you had Memphis, Louisville, Evansville. You had the big shows. But if you were on the B team, they call it the Buttermilk Loop for some reason, whatever Buttermilk means. But uh, I guess that's what you eat. But Buttermilk. Uh, was like the Buddy Wayne Towns was using Ripley, Mississippi. You know, we'd be some. We would be in Louisville, Kentucky. The other guys would be in Ripley, Mississippi. I mean, you know, so it was. Uh, uh, it just depend on what uh, you know. What what if you were on the A team or the B team? If you were, uh, you know, if it was a good territory or bad territory. What was uh, your first initial impressions of Jerry Lawler? Because you got to work with Lawler a lot, so. Yeah, I think Lawler, in my opinion, is probably one of the most talented guys that's ever been in wrestling. I mean, he's just a creative genius. Just very creative. I mean, he could come up with 10,000 angles. Everybody that come through there had an angle and uh, had some kind of gimmick, you know, Freddie Nightmare. I mean, whatever was on TV or on in Hollywood, he would have that same gimmick in the territory, so. Did you get along with him uh, politically and all that, or, you know, behind the scenes when, when yeah. you spoke? Yeah, I always got along with Jerry. I, I was always pretty, especially in my younger career, I was easy to get along with. Right. Yeah. What about uh, Jerry Jarrett? What was he like as a, as a boss? Jerry was good. He didn't come around that often, uh, but, but he was he was another creative genius. He was, they had a really good thing going on and a monopoly going on in Memphis, and uh, I really enjoyed working for him. You guys travel a lot. Obviously, the roads you know, down there were pretty tedious. You guys were on the road, what, four days, five days a week down there in Memphis? Or? Yeah. What was the schedule like for you? Well, Monday was Memphis, Tuesday was Louisville, Wednesday was Evansville, and then we'd have a spot show Thursday, and then a spot show Friday, and then TV Saturday morning, and then a show that night. We were off Sundays. Hmm. Any good road stories from uh, the Memphis era? Uh, let's see. Oh, Lord. Uh, there was the... Uh, the time that uh, 1986, when uh, Crockett fired me after the belt deal, right, uh, and I, they had actually sent me to Memphis to dry out. But when I went to Memphis to dry out, I got hooked up with this guy, and uh, he was the biggest cocaine dealer in uh, the Southwest. Uh, I, I'm not going to mention his name, but he's he, he did a lot of prison time. But anyway, uh, there was. Uh, I had loaned him a pistol. He'd gotten into some trouble and I loaned him a gun. Well, I didn't know he was a convicted felon. And I was coming out of my mom and dad's house and U.S. Marshals came up to me and asked me if I was Buddy Mandel. And I said, yeah. And they said, well, you know, we got to, you know, you got to fly down to the grand jury in Oxford, Mississippi. And what had happened inadvertently was uh, this guy had got busted for 33 kilos uh, of cocaine and machine guns and all kinds of stuff. And when they busted him, my, my pistol was with him, and they did the serial numbers, and he was a convicted felon. He wasn't supposed to have a weapon. That, I was just supposed to go to testify why that, you know, that I, uh, why that uh, he had my pistol. Of course, right. I tried to lie. This is the FBI, man. They had me in the FBI office uh, before the grand jury. Not only me, but they had me and Jerry Lee Lewis, the country singer, and the sheriff of, huh. of that of that town. So all, we were all three sitting there. Wow. And so Jerry Lee Lewis was nervous, and so was I. And uh, so the uh, FBI, I'll never forget, the redhead FBI guy come up to me, and he said, uh, now, how did he get your pistol? I said, well, I don't know. Somebody must have stolen it and give it to me. So I don't know how he got it. I said, I barely know the guy. <laughs> he said, well, before you, I'm going to ask you one more time before you answer it. He goes, I want to show you something. He turned the light out and put this projector movie on. 
and it's me and me and the guy was going down the road to his Cadillac store and coke, you know. And, wow. And so I mean they'd been watching him for a long time and I didn't know that. And that's uh, crazy. So anyway, I sang my song and that that's all they wanted. Wow. That's something that right out of a movie. Going back to Memphis, you teamed up with uh, Bill Dundee, memories of uh, working with Bill. I love working with Bill because we rode up and down the road together, crazy stuff together. Uh, and uh, we had the last sellout show there at the Memphis Coliseum was that Texas Death Match we did. It was like an hour and a half, 22 falls. Uh, this last time this, that Mid South was ever sold out it was 1986. Wow. What about uh, Dutch Mantel? You worked a lot with Dutch? Yeah, I love Dutch. Dutch and I were together uh, the night Bruce Brody got killed in Puerto Rico. What are your memories of uh, that night in Puerto Rico with Brody? Well, uh, I was uh, staying in the Panama Hotel, and he, uh, Frank, uh, Bruce Brody was at the, uh, the Blue Lagoon, and uh, he had asked me and Butch, my roommate, Butch Cassidy, was a midget, he asked us to come over and eat lunch with him right before we went over to have the big show. and. Uh, so we went over to eat with him, and we were uh, we were sitting there having uh, a late lunch, late early dinner, or late breath, late lunch with him, and uh, we were talking. And uh, the thing that strikes me odd the most is, is he reached across the table and held my hand. And I've known Brody for years, and he told me some days remember the most important things in life are God and family. And I it kind of took me aback because I mean I've known him forever. He never talked about God. He rarely talked about his family. It's like he had a premonition he was going to die, in my opinion. And uh, so later that night, you know, we uh, when we got to the building, we were I was in the hill dressing room, and they were we was in the baseball stadium, and they were on the other side. And uh, I remember the doctor first coming in and said that uh, he first told us that Brody had bumped his head and was bleeding real bad. And then about 30 minutes later, he came in and said that a fan stabbed him. And then finally, the third time the doctor came, but Doctor Hernandez was his name. Uh, the, uh, the third time he came in, he told us that uh, that Jose Gonzalez had stabbed him. Right. He was on his way to the hospital. Then we found out that night that he, that he died. Huh. And so when we walked out of the hotel the next day, Dutch came up to me and said, I said, how's Frank? He said, he's dead. I went, oh, bullshit. He said, no, he's dead. And so we we, uh, we, were, we had a show in Mike Wes that night. It was sold out. And I said, well, I'm going home. They'll kill him, they'll kill them. They ain't got a problem killing me. Right. So we all got on the front. It was me and Alice. Abdul, Abdul the Butcher and Sika and Tony. And we were all in uh, Sika's room up in, it's about 9 o'clock in the morning. We were up in his room. We all made our, made our minds up. We were going home. And we all got on the airplane and took off. Did you ever go back to the island since? Oh, yeah. I've been back several times since then. But it was never the same. Business was never the same. It was always great down there. I mean, bro, business was fantastic, but it was never the same. What is your belief that the dispute was between the two? I mean, I've heard different stories from different people that we've talked to. Well, I've heard that Brody had owned part of the company and they were screwing him or he was trying to get an upper hand or something. Then I had also heard that, uh, you know, and I know Brody used to beat the piss out of Jose. When he was back in WFTs? Yeah. I heard the yeah, same yeah, stuff. Yeah, but, but I'm also in Puerto Rico, too. Right. And then you kind of, I think it's, I think it's a little bit of all three of them that, that Brody might have owned part. They were promising something. He might have wanted more money. I, I think that Jose Gonzalez had just had a child die. You know, I mean, I, I can only imagine what it would be like to lose a child. But I think he lost his mind. And I, I think that uh, that Brody used to kick the shit out of him all the time in Puerto Rico. I mean, we used to watch him beat the crap out of him. And Jose, it would piss Brody off because Jose, instead of flying around and doing sell, he would just sit on the second or first or second turnbuckle and just lay down. He wouldn't sell. Huh. So Brody would just caused Brody to beat him that much harder. And uh, so. Right. Hmm. Going back to, uh, to Memphis territory, uh, what are your memories about uh, the Billy and uh, Buddy show? Uh. <laughs> my funniest mem my funniest memory of that whole thing was uh, that uh, Eddie Marlin uh, Eddie Marlin was building the set with the the Bill and Buddy thing right and uh, Lawler at one point was and his cue was supposed to come from the ring and hit it with a chair and smash it in a million pieces. Well, Eddie Marlin went and you know when he made this said he made it out, reinforced it out of two by fours, man. I mean, it was huh. like a small house, right? You know, and Lawler thought that it was made just out of like you know 
cheap cardboard or something. And when Lawler came out there and hit that thing, it was like, it like it started vibrating in the chair and it worked its way up his arm, up the up his arms, and it was hilarious. Uh, but uh, you know, I don't, I don't really remember that that Bill and Buddy show being that great. But to this day, that's all oh, anybody, so. that's all anybody wants to talk about, even over Flair and I. Yeah, they want to talk about uh, the Bill and Buddy show. <laughs> what about uh, I guess Lance Russell? Any good Lance Russell stories? Lance was was just always a he was a constant gentleman. He was just always a gentleman. Uh, very smart, knew his part. Uh, never had a, a, a bad word to say about anybody. And uh, just always, just always a gentleman. After the first time you were in Memphis, where did you go from there? Down to Mid South for Watts? Uh, yeah, I believe I did. Now, did the promoters have a, I guess, a big say in where you went to the different territories, or was that something that you? I'm not sure. Now, on me, on me, uh, Bill Watts always used to help me get. Bill Watts kind of had me kind of like a, uh, I don't know, prodigy or whatever. I mean, he he always took care of me. Every time I was finishing up someplace, he would call me and say, "Look, I've got you booked here." You know, he would he would always make sure that I had some place to go. Back then, having a place to go was no problem. I mean, you, you could you did work everywhere. Yeah. yeah. What were your initial impressions about Bill Watts? You hear different things about Bill, and you know, obviously, you had a great relationship. Yeah, I had a wonderful relationship with Bill. He was tough. He was just like a father to me. Even to this day, when I talk to him, he's like a dad. I'll call him up, and like the other day, I called him up about something and just advice, you know, because my father passed away a few months ago, and uh, you know, Bill's always been like a second father to me. So I call, I'll call him up and and uh, you know, ask his advice to this day. But Bill was very, very tough to work for, very hard to work for. He demanded a lot out of you. And uh, you worked really hard. You made, deep, you made good money, but you worked very hard for it. I mean, you could go to Charlotte and make probably the same or maybe even double the money but, and, and not work as hard for it. And from what I understand, the travel there was really crazy. It was brutal. It was brutal. Because there was only two interstates, and you were okay if you were going from like Jackson to Shreveport or, or uh, New Orleans to Baton Rouge. But if you had to go, like we left, to, uh, you know, uh, New Orleans on a Monday night and drove all the way up to Shreveport for interviews the next morning, that means you were driving back roads all night to hurry up and get there by nine o'clock in the morning to do interviews. Right. He used to do a lot of the promos behind his house, right, in the studio. Back in the day, some, some for TV. I think that was later. Okay. Yeah, that was later on because a lot of the interviews were done at the TV station in Shreveport. Right. Yeah.